is laughter truly the best medicine? Sharks, stingrays, and starfish meet Crown Center's newest residents. Plus nature's oasis in the middle of the urban core. And Kansas City's tiniest treasures come to life. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, William T. Kemper Foundation, Commerce Bank Trustee, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Hall Family Foundation, Johnson County Community College. Additional support provided by and KCPT members. Thank you. I'm Nick Haynes and welcome to The Local Show. In 2002, the Missouri Department of Conservation opened a unique facility on Troost Avenue in the heart of Kansas City designed to get young people in urban neighborhoods more connected with nature and the outdoors. This week, the Anita Gorman Discovery Center is celebrating its 10th anniversary. For many visitors, the Discovery Center at 47th and Troost continues to be their first introduction to nature. Surrounded by 10 acres of gardens, forests, wetlands and prairie, the Discovery Center beckons urban residents to visit and to learn. Stacy Davis is the center's manager. With as many activities and as many things as go on at the Anita Gorman Conservation Discovery Center, I'm guessing a lot of people drive by, uh, roughly 47th, 48th and mm -hmm. Troost, see something back there but really don't even begin to understand all that goes on how do you uh, how do you address that with folks we do have that quite often um, and the building was designed very green environmentally friendly and there's a reason it's set so far behind and all of that but yeah trying to reach the audience is, is a challenge uh, we've recently added new banners to the parking lot that highlight you know kids and adults doing these outdoor uh, things whether it be fishing or wildflower uh, walks or birding, that sort of thing, on the banners to kind of help emphasize that, yes, what we do inside is, is these cool nature uh, activities. Well, and it's 10 years uh, of being right here in the heart of the city, yeah. and you almost think, okay, now, why would you build a, a, a nature center in the heart of the city in the first place? Yeah, and um, Anita Gorman and the conservation commission, other conservation commissioners who were on uh, board at the time in the 90s really thought it was important to have a nature center type building that was really right in the heart of the city so that you can reach those urban audiences. That's a big part of our, you know, the conservation department is reaching all the audiences and with the urban, you know, I know I live north of the river. I don't go, you know, out to Blue Springs or out south or anything like that very often. So having something that's really close to people in the heart of the city was really important. Well, you mentioned the, the walks and I do yeah. think one of the things that I really like about the Discovery Center are those sort of ecosystem friendly ways that you can actually get out, not just be inside the building mm -hmm. and experience a lot, of, a lot of what the Conservation Department is really all about. Right. We've got three mini habitats out there, a forest, a prairie, and a wetland area. And it's great because we get to highlight the native plants that people can use in their own gardens. Um, but we also use that every day with our school programs of getting students outside and interacting with the, the natural environment. Uh, one of our big successes over the, well, this summer will be the third year we've been working with the Urban Rangers, uh, which is a group that works with um, teenage boys uh, in, in our neighborhood. and. They do a lot of different things with them, but we've been working with them to teach them uh, how to camp and canoe and fish. And we spend a couple days with them in the summer, and then we go with them down to the Current River, and they spend three days on the Current River canoeing and spend two nights camping on the gravel bars, cooking their own dinner and all of that. And that's been a really good partnership with us. You can walk in. I, su I suspect a lot of the groups, you know, our school groups, mm -hmm. but. Uh, walk-in traffic, gift shop, all sorts of things. Right? right, we've got a gift shop and we've got a few exhibits and things. We've got a great bird watching area that's inside so in the winter when the weather's really nasty you can come sit in and <laughs> have your cup of coffee and watch the birds. Uh, but yeah, Monday through Friday, uh, 8 to 5, we're open uh, that anybody can walk in and check out things. And then the first and third Saturdays we actually have programs for kids, adults, families. This winter we had a whole series on cooking, cooking with wild game, wild <laughs> plants. But then we have things like um, archery and fly tying and th those skills, things that families can learn together. Uh, the Missouri Conservation Department was really one of the early leaders. I think a lot of people forget about, you know, Missouri stepped up 
decades ago. We really did. You know, this is our 10th year anniversary this year, but it's also the Conservation Department's 75th anniversary. And from the very beginning, they had an entire section in the agency devoted to education. And they would go, you know, out to the rural parts of the state with a little projector running <laughs> films. And, you know, people remember that. But, I mean, very early on, they were, they, you know, were very into education. And when uh, our the design for conservation passed in 76. It's the one-eighth of one percent sales tax mm -hmm. that helps fund us. One of the big things that they said they were going to do was build nature centers, you know, in the major uh, metropolitan areas and they've definitely fulfilled that and the Discovery Center was was one of the last ones, most recent ones that was built. Celebration coming up I think for the 10th anniversary. Yep. On April 7th we have a uh, 10 to 2.30 we have our 10th anniversary special event for families and kids and uh, even just individual adults will have adult programming. Anita Gorman, you know, a lot of times we name buildings for people who aren't around anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not, not the case. Not but. the case. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Gorman's still around and she uh, still stops by every once in a while, but she was on our the Conservation Commission for two different terms uh, and did a, a lot of really good things for Kansas City and you know this facility is, is one of her crown jewels I think from her time on the board. All right. Well, Stacy, thanks for uh, sharing some of what's going on there at the uh, uh, Conservation Discovery Center on Truce. Good luck now and in the future. Thank you. Mary Harris Francis collected toys, Barbara Marshall fine miniatures. These two women's distinctly different collections are the backbone of Kansas City's Toy and Miniature Museum at 52nd and Oak. All year round its 33,000 square feet of displays lure the young and young at heart. Sometimes the museum, as it will this weekend with its Nettie Wells dollhouse, finds special ways to celebrate a child's imagination and the spirit of play. Mama and Papa think it's time for me to put away my dollhouse. There's just no time to play house now that we have a real house to care for. It's been in my family for so long, I can't even remember when Papa made it. Only the feeling of joy when it was received. We've done first-person performances of famous people before, but never with a child surrounding an actual object in the museum. It is really exciting to see the potential for our collection. Some of the girls at school have paper dollhouses, and some have dollhouses made out of crates, but none have as fine as house as the one my papa made for me. These words from the 1880s, spoken 130 years later by 12-year-old Macy Steele, would likely never have been heard had Laura Taylor not found this simple structure so beguiling. A dollhouse full of small but revealing pieces of an ordinary child's life. Among them, a doll named Gracie, on which Nettie Wells showered a young girl's love and affection. She wrote poetry for Gracie. She made little books for her, so she obviously had taught Gracie to read. There's this really great private story that, that comes through with all of these objects that you don't normally find. Most dollhouses, contents get lost over time. But in Nettie's case, she created a, a time capsule. So it comes to us in a really fantastically complete condition. A little automaton. Toys can also help kids learn certain skills. But the lessons this three-story dollhouse might have taught Josephine Bird, whose family owned Emery Bird Thayer, reflect a Kansas City childhood that seems very different from Nettie's. Josephine's dollhouse has an art collection in it. She went to finishing school in Florence, so there's beautiful uh, mosaic frames in her dollhouse. There's works of art that came from the Emory Birthday Art Department. It's a different type of play than the type of play that Nettie would have been doing. For instance, Nettie's mother used the dollhouse to teach her how to sew and crochet and um, to do housework. So you could actually change the bedding. When you look into Josephine's house, you're going to see the bedding is stationary. That would not have been a chore that Josephine, as a child of wealthy parents, would have needed to know. Well, in here, you really get the sense of two being in a house. This was a, like a breakfast room in the original house, all of this. The impression that you've entered a dollhouse here is by no means an accident. Mary Harris Francis and Barbara Hall Marshall were looking for just such a space to house their collections. Collections, which since the museum's opening in 1982, have continued to expand. 
That means more and more marbles. They've got the world's largest collection of them. And case after case of soldiers, puzzles, and games. Not to mention a well-dressed doll whose fashion sense still resonates with modern day girls. Well, we have that one, Mom. We have that one, the outfit. Ooh, I like it. It's really a hidden treasure here, and it's really inspiring to see how people used to play, and since they didn't have electronics and all that stuff, and how they use their imagination. And so far, it's been all about toys. But as the name implies, there's also a whole lot of tiny going on in here. We tend to make a distinction in the museum because we have both doll houses that children played with, which might or might not have architectural detail. That's not really important to the child because their imagination is, is what takes them to the time and the place that they're imagining. But in the fine scale miniature collection, reality is the key. We want everything to look as real as possible. So the fine scale miniature houses have all the architectural details that you would find in a full scale house. I've been making little things since I was a little kid. And I just, no one ever told me to stop, so I never stopped. Someone asked me to do some miniature stuff, so I did, and that was 35 years ago, and I'm still doing it. Bill Robertson has built his reputation in the art world in 112 scale, using the same simple tools and techniques as generations of woodworkers before him. From his Kansas City workshop have come some of the museum's most intricate displays. My work has been described as being very crisp, so real sharp detail to me is very important. This is a Chester County spice cabinet made about 1760. And this piece even has a label on the inside, and the label's printed on 18th century paper. You know, I just build what looks really neat, and as I put it, what needs to be made in miniature. In a lot of cases, the original's in a museum, and they won't let me have it. But in miniature, I can own that, you know? And it doesn't take up as much space, and it's easier to dust. And look at the window panels. Think about it this way. Where else can you peek in on the palace at Versailles? An Italian Renaissance studio? Or a mansion in Boston? All without leaving Kansas City. Yeah, you have to almost adjust your whole focal length here to, to start dealing. The museum is a portal to the past, a chronicle of the ways that our imaginations have served us over time. Last October, Nettie Wells' own daughter Jane walked through its doors to watch her mom's words come to life. She said, now you play that part good because Nettie was a very good person. And so I could just look out into the audience and I saw her and it helped me portray the character even more. You see, Mama is ill and I must take care of her. The new house is too large and Mama is very tired. Some dollhouses go through generations of family and each generation adds. They really become this three-dimensional family history of the children, which I think is so wonderful. We always collect these adult achievements, but these children are, are making their own record and history. Sometimes, sometimes I wish I could live in my dollhouse and everything could stay the same forever. Nettie Wells, as portrayed by Macy Steele, will share stories of her dollhouse at the Toy and Miniature Museum this Saturday with more performances later this summer. Visit our website for more details and like our local show Facebook page for your chance to win a pair of free tickets to the Toy and Miniature Museum. Now, Kansas City-based comic David Naster is still performing stand-up in comedy clubs coast to coast and, yes, on some of the world's finest cruise ships. But increasingly, he's in hot demand as a health care speaker. David Naster is considered an authority on the healing power of humor. He's written several books on the subject, including You Just Have to Laugh Through Tough Times. Now he's out with a new documentary that's currently making the rounds on the film festival circuit. Life is difficult, not unfair. A few days after 9-11, uh, there, there, there really was no laughter primarily because of the shock of it all. My family was totally destroyed. My father died in a concentration camp. 
My mother, sister, and brother died in the gas chambers. I had three fingernails on the right hand that melted, and they just turned to liquid and rolled back towards my fingers. I ended up going to the hospital with 30% of my body burned and spent 25 days in the burn unit. When she was a few hours old, it became clear there were problems. A few hours after her birth, the doctor um, let us know that she had indeed died. How do you live with that? How do you offset a little bit of that? Because it never goes away. Humor is uh, the thing that always works. So you laugh about it. Be happy. The most revolutionary act you can commit in today's society is to be publicly happy. Be revoltingly, disgustingly happy. You're a stand-up comedian, and now you're getting engaged. You've got books. You just have to laugh. Three about books. Three books. Two award winners, international award winners. These are about paralysis, Alzheimer's disease, about debilitating diseases, cancer. Now a brand new documentary <laughs> that you're now doing, laughing about these very, very serious, heavy topics. Yeah. You're supposed to be a stand-up comedian, right. David. Yeah. How did this come about? <laughs> Wow! <laughs> you, you, may, you, I never I'm wanna... in the news business, sir. <laughs> never... I'm doing a public affairs program. I never want to correct the host. It's bad form. Yes. But may, may I add something to your list of what you better not, you can't laugh at. The big one. The big one. The what big is that? The big D word. Death. Death. No jokes about death and that. Because every single thing you said, cancer, heart, anything, that all roads lead to death. You can't laugh at it. And boy, you better laugh at it. You better laugh at it. But why do I do it? I didn't find it, it found me. I'm a self-absorbed young comic. I'm gonna go out to Los Angeles. All my buddies, comics I took on the road with me, Roseanne Barr, Sinbad used to live with me. All these uh, uh, people used to warm up for me. Jeff Foxworthy, Roseanne, Sinbad, uh, Ron White used to open for me. They went to LA, I did, and I hated it out there. I was also scared of it, I'll be brutally honest with you, it bothered me. So all this stuff, is, in the meantime, people are coming, telling me these stories, Nick, you know, so this is really funny, happened, my, went to my father's funeral, it was really funny, you reminded me, we have to laugh, thanks. Another woman, David, thanks, I, I heard you perform today at the Paramount Theater in Denver, I came to this, this club tonight here in Denver, this is this, during the savings and loans problem back in the 80s, and she said, my husband is going through a bad time, he reaches over and grabs me and goes, honey, thanks for getting me to laugh, I, I think we're going to make it. And they said, thank you for getting me to laugh. They're telling me these amazing stories, and I'm going, yeah, thanks, appreciate it. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a, a self-absorbed comic. I'm not paying attention to that. I want to get on television so bad. And then one day, when I started paying attention to those stories, it all changed. Everything changed. And I realized that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I have the ability to tell stories that people have told me. The most sacred ground we walk, death. Agreed? Absolutely. The most sacred ground you can ever be on is a deathbed of a loved one. Agreed? I, I can't imagine anything would be more sacred. Here's a story a woman told me, a true story. Grandpa wants to die at his home. He's in his home, he dies, hospice is there. The minister starts a prayer circle as soon as he dies. Okay, and well, sacred time. On the, the, the phone rings at this moment. Well, nobody's gonna answer the phone. On the ninth ring, the recorder phone goes off. Whose voice is on the recorder phone? Grandpa's. What is everybody here at this sacred time? Hi, I'm not here right now. <laughs> Funny? Yes. Okay to laugh at it? Yes. And that's what we need, Nick. We need permission to laugh. Now, what, what experience do you have in the filmmaking business? <laughs> Nothing, honey. <laughs> Nothing? Nothing. Nada. You know, you know how you make a film? You make a film. You know how you write a book? You write a book. You know how you make a television show? You make one. So I wanted to make a documentary for this reason, Nick. All the people in that book I had the, the privilege and the luxury and the honor of looking in their eyes when they told me these incredible stories. I can't transfer that to people in a book, but you can in video. So when I interview Jack Mandelbaum, a Holocaust survivor, then you see him in the documentary talk about what it's like being on a pile of bodies, 14 years old, 15 years old, stacking bodies, how him and his partner are making jokes about it. As they're throwing bodies off to be burned, they're joking. In the documentary we hit, why would you do that? Why is that funny? Holocaust isn't funny. Dead bodies aren't funny. Making jokes about dead bodies at the Holocaust is really not funny. Why would you do that? And he explains why you do it. And, wh and when I saw that in his eyes, that was the most inspirational stuff 
that far beats me standing on stage telling a joke. So I, I wanted to transfer that and do that. But you're still doing the stand-up. I still will do stand-up on, on cruise ships. Begin, and not in clubs. I don't get what makes a 22-year-old laugh. I'm not, no offense, <laughs> but I'm just not, I'm not, I'm, I'm talking about stuff on stage now, doing references in, 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 in a club, and they're looking at me. I went, next time, bring your computer, Google it. Now, you said earlier on that you had dreams as a younger man. You wanted to be on TV. You wanted to be on TV. That was all it. Well, you now have this documentary. Yes. And it could go anywhere. Well, what are your it dreams it, it, for it, this? It will go. It will go everywhere. Remember the movie that Robin Williams portrayed Patch Adams? I do. Okay. Uh, that's, that's, those are two words I don't say anymore. And isn't Patch Adams, comes, <laughs> he's in the documentary. Patch Adams, I was just making a cheap joke. You said I do, and I went, oh, that, yeah. that's two words I don't say anymore because it cost me a couple houses. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Patch Adams agreed to be in the film. Patch said something so wonderful, and he did it in passing. He said, if you want your life to have meaning, help people. So now my life has meaning because I'm helping people with humor and laughter and how it gets it through. So the documentary is all these people, Jack Mann, Obama, Holocaust survivor, how he laughed, how, what Patch Adams does, four firefighters at Ground Zero, and how laughter was inappropriate but humor was okay the way they thought, but laughter is inappropriate out loud, things like that. Uh, one of the guys in the film was a local guy, Jim Fazell, a writer for the Kansas City Star. He has the most wonderful story about his father on his deathbed, a grammarian who corrects his grammar on his deathbed and then dies. I mean, an absolutely priceless, wonderful story. Jim also has Tourette's. And Jim's stories about Tourette's give you so much insight of why people with Tourette's have to laugh. I have something called Tourette's syndrome. Tourette's syndrome is a neurological condition for me. It makes me blink my eyes and shake my head like that. There was a time when a boss took me out to lunch and we couldn't for the life of us get uh, a waitress to come by our table. And he was starving and he was very mad. It seemed like about a half an hour, we couldn't get anybody to come by. And finally, the waitress came by and she said, I'm so sorry I've taken so long. Could I take your order? And I went like this and the waitress <laughs> went, okay, I'll come back later. And Scott about me alive, but you just have to laugh at that. What are you going to do? It's all these people that are just absolutely amazing. Can you tell I'm fired up about this? It's amazing to see these people and that they laugh. It's inspirational. You Just Have to Laugh is the name of the documentary. You can find out all the details on the uh, local show website at thelocalshow.org. You are always wildly infectiously enthusiastic. David Nasta, thanks for being with us on the My, Are we done? I thought we just started. <laughs> no, nine minutes goes quickly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>10 high school teams put together a two-minute news account about the sea creatures arriving at the aquarium. And the winning high school team would have their report featured right here on The Local Show. We're pleased to announce the winner is Park Hill South High School. Here's their winning report. Now that winter is over and the weather is warming up, it's not just people coming to Crown Center. What will be featured is marine creatures from our region, from the Missouri and Kansas rivers. So literally the aquatic life that you would see in those rivers will be the first display that you see carrying you out all the way to the uh, Atlantic Ocean. The Sea Life Aquarium is set to open this spring. But just how many fish are actually coming to our city? 5,000 different kinds of fish. With so many fish coming in, it is important for the transition to be just right. Sea life, fortunately, has this pretty much down to a science. It will arrive on a flatbed truck, but that's sort of a misnomer. The, the truck is actually a working lab uh, with marine biologists in back, sitting with the fish, traveling with them, making sure that they are safe and secure the entire step of the way. Now that the sea creatures are here, it's time to move them to their new home. 
and that unique home was ready due to the hard work put in over the past several months. The learning curve of never having built an aquarium before, um, just a great project, but we dealt with a lot of different people from a lot of different countries. So that was challenging, but in the same, it was fun and we got to meet a lot of interesting people. And they are already receiving feedback. The community reactions have been outstanding. Uh, I think there's, you know, tons of groups coming uh, that are already booked to show up. So uh, the community is really excited about it. Well, I think it will be another fun attraction to bring the kids to. I'm really excited. Uh, it's going to be great for the area. It's it's going to be really good for, uh, to, you know, this is this area down here is is fun already. It's just going to get make it even better. My kids are anticipating it greatly, and we can't wait. While the anticipation is high, the most important thing for now is getting the fish to their new home. Winners of the Sea Life Kansas City Aquarium and KCPT Video Journalism Contest, Park Hill South High School, and the reporting team of Sunha, Jacob Orlowski, and Raymond Hadlock. Congratulations. Like our local show Facebook page, and you can win a pair of free passes to the Sea Life Aquarium. It opens Friday, by the way. That's it for this week's local show. I'm Nick Haynes. And I'm Randy Mason. We'll see you next time. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, William T. Kemper Foundation, Commerce Bank Trustee, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Hall Family Foundation, Johnson County Community College. Additional support provided by and KCPT members. Thank you.